came along in the uh, B-17E known as the steeplechase. And this was on all of the E's and F's. And this, the E's and F's were the first true combat models of the B-17. Boeing, Douglas, and Vega built uh, the B-17 Fs and Gs. And this was the gun site that you see. It was basically a ring and, and bead site that was slaved to the guns. So wherever the guns moved, the site went. It uh, wasn't computing and uh, the gunner had to figure out his own lead uh, when the target was coming at him. And it was called the steeplechase because the gunner rode on a bicycle seat, essentially, with two knee pads in a kneeling position. And you'll see on the right, uh, a lot of people called it the jockey seat. And we had a bicycle seat, knee pads. Now, this is a piece of armor plate. The gunner reached around that to manip manipulate the guns. And that made it kind of difficult to operate. We had an oxygen blinker, a heated suit rheostat. It was minus 40 to minus 60 degrees Celsius uh, up at altitude during the bombing missions. Uh, intercom connection box. And that was the gun gunner's uh, window. It was about two and a half to three inches thick of armor glass with the armor plate below that was his protection and this is the view uh, the gunner's perspective and you can see that uh, the uh, window on the left shows how small the sighting window was and in the photo on the right there's some rubber down below and that was for the gunner's chin for when they were manipulating the guns uh, high, they had to essentially get their arms around the armor plate and push the twin gun mount down and gave them this piece of rubber to put their chin on. And this is looking from the outside in on the left and the opposite on the right. And you can see how restricted the field of vision for the gunner was there was no looking straight up and the piece of uh, metal above the armor glass uh, also re restricted the gunner's view. And there's the uh, upper view. And there's the gun sight again. So when the B-17 got into combat, uh, they needed to upgrade its armor. And here you can see an FW-190 attacking the B-17 during one of the Schweinfurt raids. So some of the attempts were the YB and the XB-40. And here they took a B-17, removed the bombs, added more guns, 11,000 rounds of ammunition. And in theory, they flew these on the outside of the formation and they thought the Germans wouldn't recognize that it was a different airplane and they would attack the outside of the formation and get quite surprised. The problem was that once all the other B-17s dropped their bombs, the YB-XB-40 was still uh, very heavy and the formations would pull away from it. So you had the radio room was removed and a Martin turret was installed in its place. And then twin gun mounts in the wastes made by United Shoe Machinery Company, which abbreviates to USMC. So there was a little confusion there. And then here's a uh, schematic view of the YB-40. You'll see in the front, the gunner was using a chin turret. And this chin turret was later adapted to the B-17G. In the center, you can see the Sperry turret, which is, you'll notice the gunner's feet are touching uh, the stand. So this turret was supported by the base, whereas the Martin turret was what they call skin supported, 
so all of the weight came through the the turret ring and that made uh for a weak spot then you had the waste gunners with the twin guns they were hydraulically operated and then you had the tail gunner in a new enclosure it looked pretty similar on the outside but it had a lot more armor plate and the guns were hydraulically operated and this is what the uh, yb-40's first tail gun incarnation looked like and you can see it's got a uh, about a six or seven pane piece of armor glass. You can see how thick it is there in the right photo. Then they went to uh, a different shaped uh, turret. And this one on the right, you'll see it has an N6A gun sight that uh, again is slaved to the guns through a rod and cable system. And this is what it looked like with the glass. So you don't have the armor glass anymore. You just have plexi now. Another operated and there's a, a larger view of it here. The turret was unique. It was very lightweight. And the guns were, the breeches of the guns were down around the gunner's feet. And it was actually built and tested, but uh, never implemented. They wanted to go with a cannon, something stronger than a 20 millimeter. Uh, the drawback with a cannon is it doesn't have the cyclic rate and can't put out as much lead down range as say a 50 caliber would. But they experimented with a uh, 37 millimeter cannon and had studies for a 40 millimeter and a 75 millimeter cannon. The drawback of course with a 75 millimeter cannon is the weight of the ammunition. And if you probably only had 12 rounds, so it's not good for a six to eight hour mission. In the Mediterranean, they did experiment with 20 millimeter cannons. And in the center lower photo, you'll notice this has a 50 caliber machine gun next to a 20, 20 millimeter uh, cannon. And they would use the 50 cal to range the target and then use the 20 millimeter cannon uh, to make the hits. And when I first saw this, I was pretty amazed. I call it B-17, what the heck? It's a long, smooth bore pipe, uh, kind of like a shotgun protruding from the tail of a B-17F. Uh, I think if you were an attacking fighter, it would certainly be intimidating. And this airplane was delivered straight to right field and used a folding fin five inch rocket. As you can see, the gunner was pretty cramped it's still the, the same steeplechase configuration. And without a breach, I would assume it got, got pretty smoky in there. And again, the cyclic rate had to be super low. But the ultimate modification to the B-17 tail uh, was the Cheyenne modification. And the Cheyenne comes from the a B-17 modification plant run by United Airlines in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And you can, if you think back to the B-17 ENF that we saw, the vision is so much greater here. The gunner could see up to the sides, the gun ball that holds the twin 50s rotated uh, nearly 180 degrees. So to make this modification, the aircraft arrived from the production line and this aircraft uh, was built by Lockheed Vega and Burbank. It was sent to Denver and then it went to the United Modification Center. You can see it on the left with the steeplechase turret. It eventually after modification went to Europe 
uh, with the 379th bomb group and was named Phyllis by its crew. So they would tow the B-17 into the modification center tail first. And on the left picture, you can see out in the, uh, the background of the photo, the B-17s that have just arrived as well. And the Cheyenne modifications started by closing up the aircraft. This is the closed waste window, the 50 caliber. And then we have the closed radar, excuse me, radio room uh, with a K-5 gun sight. And this in the center is what the E and F B-17 radio room look like. Uh, the gunner slid the guns out from under the skin here. He had a slipstream deflector and it was open to the atmosphere. Here they are at the modification center making the oxygen panels. How would you like to work with this guy? And this is the Cheyenne kit. So the airplane came in, they had they would make up one kit per plane. You had new tail turret ammo boxes, a new tail turret window, a reflector sight and armor glass, the radio room gun mount that we saw earlier, new cheek windows, new waist windows, and then the turret pumpkin and turret yoke, which will come into the story again a little bit later. So they would bring the airplane in, remove the guns and the gun sight, and then uh, make chalk marks on the tail to where they were gonna cut it. And here they've taken off the windscreen. And he starts the, the ripping process. Wasn't elegant, but it got the job done. And here it is with the steeplechase mod the steeplechase completely removed. And you can see in the right photo, the bicycle seat and the knee pads that the gunner sat on. While they were making the conversion uh, in the back of the house, they were building uh, parts of the kit. Here's the tail gunner's windscreen. And this is the pumpkin and this black piece over here is the tail turret yoke. And when they reinstalled all of these parts, uh, everything essentially hung off of that and gave it its shape. And here they're finishing the uh, installation of the skin that goes around the pumpkin. And here you can see them bucking the rivets and inside they've got the uh, gun ball, the gun pumpkin already installed. And down below here is where the ejected chutes and links come out. So if you're in the back of the formation, you've got a couple hundred airplanes ahead of you spitting out ejected chutes and links. So that had to be interesting. The turrets used an N6 or an N8 in sight like. And this is the finished product. You notice this one has slipstream deflectors on the outside, N6 gun sight. And this is this armor glass here in this trapezoid is the only armor protection that the tail gunner had in the E's and, or excuse me, in the later G models. And then a comparison of the uh, sight windows with the Cheyenne on the right. And they were installed beginning with the G-80 at Boeing, the Douglas and the Vega. And there's all the, the good folks that did the work. And as the planes would go down the line, the assembly, or excuse me, the modification line, 
uh, all the workers would sign their names and often their addresses and they'd get letters from some of the the airmen back to the workers and this is the sheet that came through with the b17f homesick angel and not politically correct in this day and age but certainly appropriate for the war so my b17 tail gunners compartment some people collect stamps other people collect cars i collect turrets so two uh, b17s went to south america after the war as cargo haulers they were november 620 lima and 621 lima and the tail gunners compartment is seen here uh, during their trips in south america one or both of the airplanes had a tail gear failure and the tail gears were tail turrets were modified uh, you can see they were meddled over the b-17s were acquired by globe air in mesa arizona and they were the airplanes were brought back to the states uh, the, this tail turret that you see here tail gunners compartment was moved around to a couple of b-17s uh, the last airplane to, to wear it was the b-17g yankee lady and that's yankee lady with the turret It was sad. All the other tail turrets laughed at it. It needed a good home. So it was removed and came to my house. And that's what it looked like when I got it about 30 years ago. So that started my quest to find all the correct parts for it. You'll notice here, this is the, the rivet line from when they uh, made the modification to the Cheyenne the turret. So my quest to find the original parts uh, involved on the left, uh, finding the original gun mount uh, that came from Iowa. The seat it came was made uh, to the exact plans by the guys who were rebuilding the B-17E Desert Rat. Then I traded a bunch of B-24 parts that I had uh, for some restoration work, which is the lower photo there. And it just wasn't quite right. The, the pumpkin opening is uh, kind of rectangular. The windows had the wrong angle. Um, so I continued my quest. The, the, part, the hunt for parts was back on. So I had a job that involved a lot of working late at night. At uh, 2 a.m. one night, I thought, you know, I'm going to take a mental break. I got on eBay and here was this, all the parts that I needed to fix my tail turret that had been found on a wreck somewhere, drilled off and a guy decided to put it on eBay with a buy it now price. Apparently a number of people had called him to talk about the parts before I found them and nobody bought them. And I needed all of those parts. So I maxed out the credit cards and five boxes showed up from Alaska. And we have, this is the skin to make the Cheyenne modification, the pumpkin. Uh, this pole holds the pumpkin with these uh, fingers, basically. The gun mount mounts here, the upper ceiling part, the, cat, the cabin, here's the turret yoke, the defrosters, the skins that go around it and the interior parts. There they are. So the stars of this show uh, are the Craftsman at Aero Trader in Chino, California. They took my turret in and started the process of uh, correctly restoring it into Cheyenne configuration and you'll see here this is the yoke and everything from the yoke hangs off of it so that that made it correct here's the completed inside you've got the 
the ammo box is sat here where it says no step. You've got the knee pads, the seat, the bicycle seat. These are original pads. Uh, the twin gun mount. Uh, this has an 8A site in it, the oxygen panel, and the communications box. And the seat goes up and down so that uh, the gunner could get some relief to his back. And you could see the ejected chute link. There was actually cloth underneath the guns that funneled the, the links and, and spent casings out. But I haven't put that in yet. Is a close up of the uh, oxygen panel. Had a window that opened. Uh, I think that was more for the gunner's comfort and smoking uh, than it was for anything else, because you certainly couldn't get through it with a heavy flying suit on. And the gun mount uh, mounted in the tail. And the N8A sight. Uh, next to the, the armor glass. And there it is externally finished. And again, thanks to uh, Tony Ritzman and Carl Scholl at Aero Trader. And that's what it looked like. And that's what it looks like now. So why restore B-17 G tail gunners compartment? My mom's uncle, uh, Robert Wolfog was selected for the 1936 Olympics. He was a uh, Olympic class water polo player at UCLA. He was disqualified from the Olympics because he was considered a professional because he worked as a lifeguard in Santa Monica. So uh, unable to go to the Olympics, the 40 Olympics were canceled. Uh, he became uh, a bank, worked at a bank. And he, during, by the time he volunteered for the war and got into combat, he was 29, which was quite old for World War II and married. In our family, we never knew uh, what happened to him. All we ever heard was he was shot down and died. And I was reading a book by Evo DeYoung called Mission 376. The book was $80, which was far above my threshold for buying a book. And uh, finally, I, I plunked down the money, bought the book, and never knew why I needed the book so bad. Uh, I was this is my uh, mom's uncle there. He was a bombardier. The airplane they flew was Decatur Deb. And one of the jackets survives uh, from an earlier crew, uh, Robert Fergosi. It's now on display at the Parham Airfield Museum in England. And they were shot down attacking the Rothensee synthetic oil plant outside of Magdeburg, Germany. And this is a target photo from May 28th of 1944. So about uh, eight days, 10 days before uh, D-Day. Their squadron, the 571st, was hit by 40 FW-190s head on. And turning the page in Evo de Young's book was this picture of Alfred Binseal. Uh, Field Webel is basically a staff sergeant. He was flying uh, the airplane with these markings. And after the war, the wreck of it was found and it was restored and it's on display in Germany. So three uh, men from the back of the airplane got out and the rest of the uh, crew was killed when the airplane went down. The 390th bomb group lost six flying fortresses that day. At least they did a good job knocking out the uh, oil refinery. And then my mom's uncle is buried in uh, Belgium. And then my turret uh, is on display at the 390th Bomb Group Memorial Museum. I just took it down there in January. And they have this B-17 all be around with a life-size uh, painting of the B-17 showing 
uh, each crew position. And there's the my turret in front of the crew position and next to the B-17. And that's the story of my 30 year quest to restore a B-17 tail gunner's compartment. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. That was fascinating. Um, those of you with questions, please use the chat feature and that's found at the bottom of your Zoom window and you can just type in what's on your mind and I, I'll get things rolling a little bit. Um, Nick, it's a long flight to where, where the aircraft is targeted to bomb in Germany or, or in France or wherever it was uh, targeted. Does the tail gunner get a chance to just lay down or something while he's waiting to get on target? Or is he sitting in that, that uh, seated position uh, the whole flight? <laughs> That's a great question. They typically didn't get into the, the tail gunner's compartment until they got about to the midway middle of the English Channel. So he wasn't always cramped in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I was curious. And, and you know, with the top turret and the bottom turret covering some portion of what's behind the airplane, and then the addition of the tail gun, how lethal was the B-17G as far as airplanes wanting to approach it from behind? <clears throat> when you had a formation of, you know, 50 or, 50 or 60 airplanes near each other, uh, they could they could put a lot of lead down, down range. And that's why you had the, the uh, German Luftwaffe attacking from the front because until they got the Cheyenne, or excuse me, the uh, chin turret, uh, the, the front was more vulnerable and safer for them to attack. Did the tail guns movements actually, were they somewhat limited uh, to just cover that one cone of the field of fire or, you know, how far could that gun really move around? <clears throat> In the B-17 E's and F's, it was pretty restricted, uh, maybe 30, 30 degrees per side. And uh, if, if the gunner could get his chin down low enough, they could probably get up to about uh, 80 degrees. But with the Cheyenne, uh, they had nearly you know, 180 degree coverage on the back of the B-17. A question here from uh, Roger Kane, which is how many rounds did the tail turret gunner have available? About 650. Okay. And that goes very fast when you have a, a gun that'll fire 800 rounds uh, per minute. I was also noting, you know, when you were showing sort of the interior of the tail gunner compartment, the, the, the hole where the shells are ejected or whatever that is, you know, I, I have to imagine that that's plugged up somehow because it must be pretty darn cold back there. I mean, obviously the B-17 is at altitude as high as it can get probably en route and then it drops to a target altitude, uh, you know, what, what were the, uh, you know, once you got into that tail compartment, you know, what were some of the things that the gunner would do to just keep cold air out of that compartment and, and little mods that they might make on their own to just stay warm? <laughs> I, I really don't think there were any things they could do. They were wearing a heated flight suit and uh, uh, leather uh, sheepskin hat uh, with a helmet over it, they would sweat during the mission and the sweat would go into the oxygen tube and they had to literally crunch the, the, the oxygen tube to keep ice from forming and blocking their uh, airways. Uh, that's why the Cheyenne modification closed up the radio room uh, hatch and the two waste windows to alleviate uh, a lot of that the air blast going straight into the tail. Hmm. Well, you managed to find a guy in Alaska with some parts. I'm, I'm assuming there are other people out there building other gun positions. That's one of the questions Bert Rosenzweig has. Are there other collectors you've uh, met that are building the other uh, emplacements? <clears throat> right now, I think there's five B-17s being uh, either built from scratch or rebuilt. And 
as far as aircraft gun turrets go, there, there's a whole subculture. We have a Facebook group, Aircraft Gun Turrets, that you can join and see all the different projects. Uh, there's a guy I hang her with, Ty Rainey out in Stockton, has a working ball turret, a working B-29 a center fire control system. I've got a privateer bow turret that I'm having restored in Arizona. And here at my house, I'm working on a Catalina bow turret. And they're, they're just a whole bunch of us. So what was worse, the tail gunning position or the ball turret as far as discomfort for the crew member? <laughs> my, my guess would be the ball turret. Right. Um, you, you couldn't be over about five foot seven. I've gotten in the ball turret and, and squirreled it around, but that was for maybe three minutes. Uh, I'm six foot and it's very, very cramped. Yeah, I'll bet. Robert Kern has an interesting question, which is, uh, as a gunner, were you always assigned to the same position on the aircraft on every flight? I mean, size might be part of it. <clears throat> Mostly they were cross-trained so that, you know, if someone were down, right. someone else could take their place. Right. How, what was the sort of priority when you started getting wounded crew as to what they would try to obviously maybe depending on where the aircraft enemy aircraft were coming from but you know was the tail position the last one to get manned if if there was a waste gun position down or something or what was there a priority <clears throat> it, it depended mainly where the airplane was in the formation and the coverage they were getting from other aircraft around it uh, later in the war they reduced the crew from 10 to 9 so that you had only had one waste gunner. So uh, the, the waste gunner could pop from left to right side, depending on where the action was. So I would, I would think that, uh, you know, it would depend on where in the formation they were. Somebody's asking a question. It's, it seems to be a generic question. Chris Talbot's asking, what's a B-24? That's, that's a four engine bomber. <laughs> Built by Consolidated. And the Army Air Corps always liked to have a, a backup. Uh, the B-24 and the B-17 were essentially built at the same time. Had one failed, the Army Air Corps would have had the other one. The B-29 was backed up by the B-32, the B-29 B being successful. The B-32 was uh, essentially not used. Another interesting question that always comes to my mind, too, is that, you know, with these... Formations of the uh, B-17s, and I remember seeing very complex kinds of arrangements so that they could get overlapping fields of fire. How, how uh, sloppy could a pilot be in their formation flying before they started spraying friendly fire all over the place? I mean, how common was that? <clears throat> I'm sure it was common, but the formations had to be, be tight, and they were drilled and drilled and drilled on that. Right. So... Uh, it took like an hour just to get into formation. It seemed like after they uh, took. Yeah, if not longer. Yeah, yeah, that's and the when one. You're trying thing. to uh, assemble a, th a thousand airplanes uh, heading in the same direction at the same time. Right. They never show that in the in the movies. You know, they just show the plane taking off and then it's on its way. And it's like, well, wait a minute. There's this whole part where they all get into formation. So, uh, um, yeah, interesting. Uh, well. What other projects do you have? Uh, you, you mentioned some of the other uh, B-17 projects that are going on that maybe you're involved with. What, what are some specific things that you can share about what you're working on? <clears throat> uh, I've been trying to supply parts to uh, you know, any, anyone I can get them to. I just sent two uh, pilot directional indicators. You always hear them in the movies, PDI centered. I sent a couple of those out to different uh, bomb site restoration projects. Mm -hmm. And there's, interestingly, there's like five PBY Catalinas coming together uh, at the same time. Uh, the couple guys in Oregon have one. There's three or four down in Florida. The Collings Foundation has one that I believe has a, a submarine kill to its credit. And they're reinstalling the nose turret there. And I've been helping out with uh, some of the uh, decals that go in the turret for authenticity and uh, various gun mount parts. 
Well, 1B17 that was kind of in the news with its restoration for a long time was the Memphis Bell. And I, I remember seeing it. Uh, it wasn't as knowledgeable as I now am on the tail turret. So what, what was the story with their tail turret? Um, it's a Cheyenne tail turret. And they, the Air Force Museum has really done a nice job putting it back together. Uh, very original. One thing I found out the other day, I was quite surprised, this was last week, that the name Memphis Bell is copyrighted by the Air Force Association. So I thought that was kind of sneaky since that airplane essentially belongs to all of us. So, right. Taxpayer. That's a beautiful airplane. I'm hoping to see it early next year. Yeah, that, that was a long project. That that languished for a long time out in wherever it was on display and, and it was practically uh, just like a gutted wreck almost. And then, you know, it took some time to, to bring that back. What, what do you think about, what can you say about the business of restoration, something like the tail uh, gunner where you're having to rebuild and reconstruct things. And so you're, you're trying to preserve some of the original material rivets and how do you approach the technology piece as far as being as faithful a reconstruction as you can make or whether you just use whatever ter uh, rivets you can find or you know what's the spectrum right there <clears throat> i i missed part of your question because the it, in cut out but say that my made it uh too narrow for the original parts to fit on it. So the uh, plans had to be pulled. We had to make new uh, stringers for it. And all of uh, the original parts were made to airworthy uh, condition and the same type of rivets were used. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, that's the, the thing now is 35, 40 years ago, you could have got away with with using something else, but now it's trying to be as original and right. true to the uh, specification as possible. Yeah, a, a more rigorous standard. Um, getting back to the question of, of cross training, were crew members also trained fly so that they could take over if a pilot was uh, injured or incapacitated? Typically, uh, you have pilot, co-pilot, uh, bombardier, uh, would have been able to usually come up and uh, take over the controls. Right. But everybody else uh, had their specialty. Well, that's that's intriguing. And uh, everyone should have a project like that to uh, spend their passion and time and energy on. Uh, I don't see any more additional questions here. So unless uh, folks have some more uh, intriguing nuggets of information to share or ask Nick about, we'll... Uh, wrap it up here and thank Nick Veronico for his presentation on his uh, B-17G tail gun restoration. So go ahead and give him a, uh, a hand clap or a thumbs up using your reaction features on your Zoom window. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Nick, for coming out tonight and sharing with us. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And for everybody else, we're going to gather again in about a month on May 26th for our uh, to be announced special super top secret program uh, coming up at the end of May. So we we'll look forward to see, seeing you then. So everybody have a great uh, uh, weekend coming up and we'll look forward to seeing you here at the Hiller Aviation Museum. Thanks. <laughs>